Today's video is sponsored by PistonAddict.com, the pan-European auction platform specialising in classic and exceptional vehicles. You list the car, set your reserve and Piston Addict does the rest, making life easy for both buyer and seller in a nice 7 day auction format. To celebrate their launch, they are offering a zero selling fee for their classic pack with the use of my code JM. To find out more or subscribe to their newsletter for information of upcoming auctions, head over to PistonAddict.com. Today I am talking Maserati, a brand that many of us petrol heads say that we love, but sadly for many it is from afar. And the reasons are simple, though the cars are almost universally pretty and often accompanied by a glorious soundtrack, they have that mysticism, that exotic feeling that you get from a proper Italian thoroughbred and without the pomp or the arrogance often associated with a prancing horse or a raging bull, we all kind of know that they are likely to let us down, both in terms of the driving experience, which often fails to match the glamour of the looks, and also in the most basic sense. They're a car that you know because your friend bought one is going to spend more time in the garage than your garage. And even for people like myself who have previously owned a Maserati, become quite fond of the brand and had a generally good experience, in the last few years it's been very, very difficult to find a product in their new catalogue that's actually worth your money. Happily though, times they are a changing and it would appear that once again Maserati fans have something to be proud of and to shout about. First off you have the, albeit late, reintroduction of the Gran Turismo. The all new second generation car looks fabulous, is available with a different range of power options and over the next few years I hope that car will become an interesting and offbeat but not unworthy alternative to a 911 Turbo S, a Porsche Taycan or a Tesla Model S. But the big news, the one I think none of us expected, is this, the MC20, Maserati's re-entry into the supercar arena after half a century off. I personally do not count the MC12 because we all know that was just a re-bodied Enzo sold exclusively so Maserati could go racing with it. There wasn't really anything Maserati about it at all. This though, I cannot say the same for because from the ground up it is all new, all Maserati and very very special. But that's on paper. What's it like in the real world? Will this be another typical Maserati disaster? A car that over promises and under delivers? Or will it be the long awaited triumph of the Trident that we all hoped they could build but few of us thought they actually would? Time to find out. <laughs> The MC20 is a car that had both my attention and my curiosity from the moment it was announced, for many different reasons. First off, thanks to the fact that many, many of you, near 300,000 now, have decided to join me on this wonderful and crazy adventure I've been on over the last seven years, I am now actually in a position where I could potentially afford a car like this. I've often said that I would love just once to buy something from you, spec it to my requirements and have something that is truly designed for me. But it feels like time is kind of running out for me because there are fewer and fewer cars available each year which are both worthy of spending money on and also that you can actually do interesting stuff with. The all new Lamborghini Revuelto I'm sure is lovely and wonderful but it's also going to be half a million quid. I could sell everything that I own and just about cobble together a deposit. Meanwhile, the Ferrari 296 is 300,000 quid by the time you've even looked at the options list and I'm not sure you can actually order one anymore anyway. The Lamborghini Huracan, meanwhile, is essentially out of production again in the guise that I would want. I don't believe you can get it. 
the Audi R8. Similarly, lovely car, and I would have one of those, but you can't get all the nice exclusive options here in the UK because Audi GB are boring. An Artura would be a possibility, as would potentially A750S, but the latter is very expensive, the former I don't like the looks of, and McLaren dealers still have me on their shoot to kill list. The Honda NSX was also unceremoniously discontinued about five years ago, and it was such a popular car here that I don't think anybody actually noticed. That leaves me with relatively few options, but as both somebody who enjoys driver engagement, I'm a former Lotus owner as well as an Italian car fan, the MC20 seems to do an awful lot absolutely right. First up, you've got a carbon fibre tub built by Dallara, who construct both Indy cars and also GP2s. This means they kind of know what they're doing, and as McLaren have shown over the last decade, a carbon fibre tub is an excellent starting point for a supercar. Connected to that is a double wishbone suspension, front and rear, with Bilstein adaptive Damptronics X shock absorbers on each corner. Behind me you then have an all-new engine, dubbed Nettuno or Neptune by Maserati. It is a 3-litre twin-turbo V6 that makes a staggering 630 horsepower and 538 pound-foot of torque. That's 730 newton meters. Though that is certainly down on the Ferrari 296, which makes another 200, interestingly the torque figure is actually essentially the same as the McLaren Artura, which also has a 3-litre twin-turbo V6 but hybrid assistance as well. It achieves those figures through various different methods, including Formula One derived pre combustion chamber technology. Essentially, there's almost a sort of mini cylinder above the main one where a spark plug sits that sets off the initial combustion that travels through down into the cylinder. And it's a, a little bit, I guess, like Mazda system where it's compression as much as a spark that sets things off. There is then a secondary spark to be used when the system isn't needed, and um, I've probably explained that really, really badly. But the main thing you need to know, lots of power, two turbos, but no hybrid. The gearbox, an eight-speed DCT built by Tremec, who have very little experience in the dual-clutch segment. In fact, none. This is the same box as you'll find in the Chevrolet Corvette C8. And I know, therefore, that it's good, because I wasn't a fan of that car, but the gearbox was excellent. So keen actually were Tremec to get the gearbox right that because they had little experience, when they were developing the gearbox for the Corvette, they simply bought a company who specialised in building software and other things for dual clutches. That's quite cool. The body on top, I must admit, when Maserati announced the car, I wasn't really a big fan of. I thought it looked very, very bland and just a bit meh. However, in the flesh, it's certainly a lot more attractive. It has a real elegance to it and an imposing stance. You've also got billionaire doors, which I utterly love, and they've even managed to appeal to the audiophile in me as well, because this car is one of the first production vehicles to have the option of a Sonus Faber stereo, which, time permitting, I'll have a little listen to in a bit. Now, this is all very good news, but I feel honour bound to put my cards on the table, because when I did some more digging into the MC20, there were a few things I found that I really, really didn't like. Those include the fact that Maserati claim this car weighs less than 1,500 kilos, which would be impressive and certainly not impossible given the carbon aluminium construction. Many McLarens weigh far less than that. But unfortunately, Maserati, it would seem, have indulged in the great Italian tradition of um, fibbing, if we were going to be polite about it. On Italian scales, I'm eight stone, and on real scales, this is not 1,500 kilos. It's about 1,660. Or, to put it another way, it's actually about 20-odd kilos heavier than the Ferrari 296, which has nowhere near as much carbon fibre in it, and also a hybrid drive with the motors and batteries associated with that setup. That's embarrassing. I don't know where the weight went. It's also a relatively large car, bigger than a Ferrari F8 Tributo, and in spite of that, it has nearly no space whatsoever. The cabin is okay, it's actually pretty generous, and uh, the billionaire doors have a nice big aperture so you can get in and out easily. Compared with any early McLaren, the 650-12C, it's a joy, and certainly, next to say a Lotus Elise, it's absolutely fine. I really like it, it's a bit of theatre, it's very cool. However, 
it's the boot space that isn't so good. Up front you've got what I really don't want to call a boot, I mean I'm struggling to call it an aperture, but um, there's a flap under which you could put maybe a ream or two of A4 paper. It, it's pretty shocking. I'm amazed they even tried to give you any space up there. At the back, sort of Lotus Elise slash Honda NSX style, you do also have another boot, but it's also pretty stingy. Combined space, I think, is about 150 litres, and though you can take this thing away, uh, I don't know how you do it. That being said, this car's owner, David, is an absolute legend, because not only has he brought me this car to drive, he has taken it away. He's just done a several thousand mile road trip around Europe. And I think that's brilliant. I'm really, really glad that A, it can be done, and that B, he did it. What a superstar. Next up on my hit list, that engine. All new, I think, is another Italian exaggeration. The heads certainly are novel and unique to Maserati, but the rest of it is suspiciously similar to the unit you'd find in an Alfa Romeo Giulia Quadrifoglio. This is the reason it's a 90 degree, not 60 degree V6, and that's why, even with a big shouty exhaust, it would never, ever sound great. And um, that, I think, is a shame. But we'll see whether the engine is good enough or not in a little bit. And finally, the price. If you were to Google how much this costs, you'd be told about £190,000. But actually, it's more like £196,000 for the base model before options, and the options list is a little bit eye-watering. In fact, I'm going to let VoiceOver JM talk you through some of it now. It starts with essentials like the suspension lifter at £3,250 and the electronic limited slip differential, which should be standard but isn't, and is £2,150. The Sonus Faber stereo is priced comparably to a Burmester of a Porsche at £3,750. Heated seats are £500, though if you want the lightweight buckets, they're £5,900 and can't be heated. If you want a bit of carbon and heating, you can have the seat backs of the regular ones in it, which you'll never see, at £4,300. Brake calipers in black, blue, red, silver or yellow, 1100 quid. Auto dimming mirrors, 650. Garage door opener, 400. But after that, it gets a bit out of hand. The roof in black, £3,750. In carbon, £5,900. The forged wheels, as seen on this car, £4,850. And if you want them diamond cut, add about another grand. If you want the popular blue Infinito paint, the launch colour essentially, that's £4,300. Pricey, but a bargain compared to those on the special order Fiori Zeria list. Blue denim, a solid colour, not even metallic, that's £16,200. Haven't been to Specsavers lately and fancy digital mint? £21,600. But even that pales next to the military teal or powder nude at £27,000. Still too subtle? Why not add a garish livery, yours for just £10,800. And if you're fond of carbon, Maserati have conveniently made two packs, one for the interior and one for the exterior. But they don't include everything, just the stuff you can't get separately. The interior one is vaguely reasonable at £6,450, but the exterior one consisting of carbon front splitter, rear diffuser, underdoor and sills and bonnet painted in carbon, along inexplicably with dark exhaust tips, is a frankly staggering 34000 200 pounds. The net result of all of that is that even a modestly specified car such as this, which has the black paintwork because David wanted it to be a little bit more subdued, the nice extended leather Alcantara interior because he didn't want to be boring, and things like the suspension lifter, which you absolutely definitely need. This car has already scraped on a few pieces of road where nothing else does. Like a lot of other manufacturers, below this car you'll find different veins channeling the air about, and they like to smack into the ground a lot. In fact, when you buy an MC20, if you buy an MC20, just buy a spare set of those. Just do it in case they go out of production, because you're going to need them. 
get even a little bit fruity with the options list though and you're talking about a 250 thousand pound car which is very serious in fact the mc20 cielo the uh, open top version which is currently doing the rounds has been specced to three hundred and five thousand pounds that's a lot I did also want to do a little bit of whinging about the interior because again in photos it simply didn't look anywhere near good enough for the money. There are certainly weak points in it, the buttons on the wheel just aren't good enough. However, I must admit, in the flesh it is better than you would expect. These seats are quite nice, they don't feel quite as hugging as I'd like but when we get into a bend at some speed I'll see how they do. However, the overall effect is still of something that's fairly special. Sure, the screen down here is just the same as you'd find in, well, probably a Fiat 500, but it works. It's got Android Auto, it's got Apple CarPlay, and so I suppose that is a step forward. It doesn't look horrendously out of date the minute it's new. And there are nice touches, like the little mode selector down here, which is a combination of rotary dial and a screen. You twist around for the different settings, wet, GT, Sport, Corsa and ESC off. And if you want your bumpy road mode equivalent, you just swipe the screen and then twist the dial again. I quite like that. Very neat, very nice. You've then just got two buttons here, some controls here for the windows and the volume, which are a bit cheap and nasty, but you can't see them, so it doesn't matter. The digital dash is actually okay enough. It's fairly small, but gives you all the information that you need, and you can configure it to various different things, and as you change through the drive modes, it does change the display as well. But enough rambling. I think the car is now thoroughly warmed through. I've got an idea of the road conditions and all that jazz, so uh, let's turn it around and let's discuss that. This car has the suspension lift, and honestly, I'm not even going to try doing this without it because it will be terrifying. Quite a nasty ramp to get out of here. No concept of where the front is. The gearbox does go into reverse pretty readily, and uh, like a Ferrari, just pull the paddle to get back into drive. But, oh, I'm just waiting for the scrape there. I'm just so terrified it's gonna hit the ground, but it didn't. You need the lifter. So, I'm gonna start in GT mode. The car's in its softest, most limp setting. Dampers are in soft. I'm gonna put it manual mode, drop a gear, crunch time. Maserati MC20, no excuses. How good are you? car came out I expected that it was going to get a battering I'll be totally honest regardless of how well or not their F1 teams are performing on the road both McLaren and Ferrari are really at the peak of their game both producing incredible supercars I know people think that I hate McLarens that's not true I dislike the way the company does some things but the cars have almost universally been amazing Unfortunately, I haven't been able to drive an Artura, very few people have, and I haven't driven a 296 GTB. What I did instead though was today I came out in my 430 Scuderia because I figured this car with its no hybrid, no nonsense, back to basics approach would appeal to the sort of person that would buy a 430 Scuderia and if you could afford one of these you can afford a 430 Scuderia, a highly spec one of those is 200 and a low spec one of these is 200 so um, it seemed like a fair comparison and um, I am honestly absolutely perplexed how this car has garnered the awards that it has. Genuinely, totally baffled. I am currently in GT mode. I have got the dampers set to their absolute softest. And these are Bill Stein's Super Duper Fancy Pants Ultra Shiny Damptronic X. We've got more power in the suspension now than what put man on the moon. And it's awful. The ride quality is absolutely atrocious. I mean, really, really bad. How any, any British road tester said that this was okay is utterly, utterly and totally beyond me. 
It is genuinely baffling. I am sure you can see the problem. I am actually worried that it's going to shake a camera off the car. Honestly, I'm not exaggerating. I am really concerned that that is going to be an issue. This is one of the smoother bits of the test route and it's still fidgety, it's still struggling. I mean, I don't know if I even want to try the stiffer modes, but in the name of science, I suppose I should. Let's go to sport mode. This dial is not responsive there, that's sport mode. And uh, let's, uh, what are we in, are we in? We're in, this is the mid setting. And it's even jitterier, it's even firmer. Of course, you've got a hold to engage quarter. I mean, yeah, that's just rocks now. I mean, yeah, now, now it just feels like there is no suspension in the car. You can see that, right? You, you, you can see what's going on here. Right. I'm going to put it in sport now, uh, with the dampers in soft. Because I'm going to do my very best to ignore those for a moment. It'll be tough, but I'll try. There are other things about the car that I do like. The engine. Holy heck. This thing is quick. Yes, it may be considerably heavier than Maserati claim, but another great Italian tradition is that even though you know it's much podgier than its maker says, it still feels blooming heck. Rapid. Really rapid. Once this thing's on the boil, and let's see when it is on the boil, shall we? Let's drop it down to 2,000 RPM. Mm, two and a half to three. Two and a half to three it wakes up, and the red line is basically eight. But even at five, oh my word, this is intergalactic speed. Not exciting though. A lot of dramatic noise. Very, very flat. Let's try and focus on the steering for a moment. It's responsive for sure. I mean, it turns in really well. Ruddy should, given how stiff it is, that's for sure. And the gearbox is responsive. The gearbox is nice. It doesn't have that crack or pop of some systems. Maybe it does in Corsa, but I seem to remember in the Corvette it was similar. And honestly, I just don't want to try Corsa because in Corsa, like the Alpha, I don't think you can have the soft dampers. Let me have a look. No, you could just have mid and hard. That's it. Let's just check if the gearbox is any different though. No, not really. The turn-in is phenomenal. I mean, the turn-in is just incredible. And I bet on a track, this thing is an absolute riot because there, the engine's always gonna be in its happy place. The dampers are gonna do their job wonderfully and you're going to really really appreciate it this uh, this suspension is actually giving me a hard time trying to work out if the steering's actually any good at low speeds there's just no feel whatsoever i mean absolutely none it's really heavily assisted it's electric by the way but that no longer means that it has to be lacking in feel i'm sure some have already pointed out that uh, up here the rear view mirror is actually a screen there is a mirror as well if you want it but you can't see anything I like the driving position. I like the driving position a lot. The seats are actually pretty good. They're holding me in well enough. I'd love harnesses if they were an option, but I don't think that they are. You can get sportier seats though. The windscreen feels like it's been profiled in such a way that it gives you a little bit better view. I feel like I have a little bit more glass in here than I do in a Lamborghini. If you were to take this up to Scotland or so, you could actually see some of the scenery. Or oh, I want to check something else as well, actually. Which I know is going to sound a bit weird. I want to see the buffeting's like. Actually, it's not that bad. All right, more plus points for Maserati. Like many a Ferrari, like the 430. Window down, this is really pleasant. And you can hear the exhaust a little bit more, and though it isn't a tuneful thing, you can appreciate it. I would drive the car like this all the time. Let's have a quick listen to that Sonus Faber stereo, shall we? I keep thinking that a camera has fallen off, but actually stones flick up, they hit the bottom of the tub, and it's quite loud. This display is not very responsive, I can tell you that much. Okay, so stereo I've tested, and um, it's all right, it's decent. It's not gonna blow you away as an audio file, but actually it's better than the upgrade systems and many other cars. I definitely, definitely have the Sonus Faber, and at the price, I think it's reasonable. As we are in a bit of a traffic jam now, other things to report, well, the fuel tank. 
it's pathetic. 60 litres, which in anything vaguely sporty is just not enough. In something like this, it's atrocious. Where David lives, around town, this car will only get about 120 miles between stops. In fact, it's currently got more than three quarters of a tank and it's estimating 155 miles of range. On a run, it's a bit better, but then again, you're only still gonna get maybe 250 miles between fill-ups. And if you do dare take this on a long journey, well, it's just not enough, is it? It's just not enough. You know what's really frustrating is that actually I thought ahead of this review that there were going to be lots and lots of things which I've already discussed that I wouldn't like and there wasn't really anything that was going to change that, boot size and the like. But I did think that in terms of the drive, it was going to be sensational. And it's exciting. I mean, it's hilarious, but it is like tying yourself to the back of a very, very angry ox and then saying something unpleasant about its mother. You'll get down the road very quickly and there'll be lots and lots of noises, but not all of them pleasant. And at the end, flipping it, you will be black and blue. It is devastatingly quick in a straight line. I mean, just, just savage. How quick? Uh, let me show you, all right. Uh, get down to 40. Yeah, we're at 40 and foot down, 50, 60. If this were the MC20 RS, if they said this is the hardcore track one, I'd be sat here going, hmm, yeah, okay. It's not good on the road, but it's not meant to be. Oh, incidentally, these doors, you can never close them properly. You've basically got to slam them. There isn't a soft close option. And uh, about 10 times this morning, I just haven't shut them properly. That's irksome. Surely someone noticed that in the development process. Surely. Apparently not. It's probably also, once you do go on track, gonna eventually be a bit too heavy. It is still 1,660 kilos. The Scuderia, to provide a point of reference, is 1,400. It's a quarter of a ton lighter. And it's more comfortable. And it makes a better noise. And the gearbox is more fun. There was a genuine chance the Scuderia could have been at risk today. It's not. And that's a shame. I would love to spend some more time with this car, but I do have a sneaking suspicion that, um, yeah, my opinion probably wouldn't change. But in any case, I am incredibly grateful to David for having brought it out, and as ever, to you for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.